Hello, can you tell me your name, where you grew up, and what connection you had to textiles as a child? I'm Bonnie Meltzer. I grew up in Irvington, New Jersey, which is right outside of Newark. Actually, kind of almost part of Newark. Heavy-duty place. Um, my mother was an embroiderer and a sewer. Uh, she didn't sew clothes, but she, she made little funny things. And um, we, she taught me how to do those things, and her mother taught her. And um, my grandmother was, a, unfortunately, she didn't live long enough, but she did a lot of textile things. Mm. What do you create, and how has your career as an artist evolved? Oh, well, um, when other kids went roller skating, I made doll clothes. <laughs> <laughs> when other kids, you know, went out and played, I either read or drew or did things. Um, I still have my doll clothes, by the way. They're kind of rotting. But it, it was great. It was a way of being by yourself and accomplishing something and getting involved into your imaginary world. Um, my, I went to school... I went to teacher's college and I was an art major and I taught high school art for three years. And I, the school I went to, which was Montclair State, which is a New Jersey college, did a very great thing. They taught us one, you took a two credit course in everything. So you did printmaking and you did textiles and you did sculpture and you did drawing you just pick pick a topic and you did it you did jewelry making um and i got a job for the textile with a textile teacher as part of a you know work scholarship program and she adopted me and um textiles we, we had this connection um and we were friends until the day she died. So um, textiles was, was something I was good at. Um, I mean, I started as a painter, but text, you know, there was something about textiles, you know, the, the tactile quality, the three-dimensionality of it um, that I didn't get from painting. And then I went to graduate school for textiles in University of Washington. Mm -hmm. How were textiles thought of in the art world uh, when you started your career? <laughs> well, you know, in the 60s, all those fiber things were hot. And then the 70s came, and by the time I got out of school, which was in 71, graduate school, a lot of the textile departments just dried up. I thought I was going to get out of school, get a job at a college. Well, then, of course, then I was suckered into the Northwest, and I didn't really want to leave the Northwest. So, um, and there weren't, there really weren't any jobs here. Mm. So I've been essentially self-employed. I've, I've now learned since this pandemic that I've been a gig worker for my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> um, how have your activism and, rep or how has activism and repair influenced your, your work over your career? Oh, well... Um, I've always been interested in doing artwork that was about something, opposed to about paint or about yarn, even though, you know, I just do like to touch all that yarn. Um, and very early on, I started doing things that were social commentary. Um, even back in the, in the, in the 60s when I was a teacher, um, and it just continued, and I've been really interested in um, environmental things. So I did a piece I, when I was cleaning out the shed. This is the clean. I've been, you know, getting rid of lots of stuff. And there was a piece called uh, Particulate Matter, which was quite interesting because um, it was done in the early '80s. The piece over uh, the window that you saw that you like with the beads was also called particulate matter. But I didn't even, when I was doing it, I didn't even remember that piece. It was, you know, stuck in the back corners. 
and it was also called Air Over New Jersey. Um, and that was a long time ago. And I've, I've been doing those kinds of pieces where there are commentaries. I did a lot of things with computer parts and made comments about computers and what computers are and using the words like memory and relating it to us as well as to computers. Um, so it's been very interesting and I love doing research. So anytime I had a topic, you know, I'd get lost in the, in the research, mm -hmm. I, you know. Um, I made a wedding cake and it was all people who were um, of mixed marriages. Mm -hmm. Um, because my in-laws were quite nasty mm. about that we were not of the same background. And so I gathered all these wonderful pictures and made this wonderful... But I got so stuck into the research, I mean, that I didn't really need for the piece. It was just like a whole other... It was just like a whole other interest that I developed. Um, so... But I've also done quite a few pieces that were um, meant to educate. Um, I don't know if you, re you were here then, but in 2012, they were going to build six coal terminals, export terminals, along the coast of Oregon and Washington. Mm. And I was very active in that, along with you know, thousands of other people. And um, I was giving out some, we made a map and I was going out around to different places and I went to Blackfish and gave them, because they were right near where the train is. Mm. And they said, they called a little while later and said, you want to do a piece about that and put it in our window? So mm. I did a, a piece about coal um, and air currents and particles of coal. And it was a really nice installation. And then I don't know, it just kept going and I kept doing these installation pieces and I did quite a few window projects where there was that environmental theme was, was, always, was always kind of part of it. I did a whole show, and this will kind of answer some of the questions we talked about before. How did I get the idea for Tikkun Olam mending the social fabric? Hmm. On January 20th, 2017, mm -hmm a monumental date in mm. my mind, people started talking about the un unraveling of the social fabric. And I was sitting there going, yes. <laughs> mm. And I did a whole show um, in Hood River um, about the unraveling of the social fabric and that piece over there, um, the social justice moral fiber mm. piece was part of that show. But when I start, I kept a notebook of all the ideas and every time somebody said something about the social fabric or used fabric idioms, which are so inbred into the society, so inbred into people's visual and verbal vocabulary because they wear clothes, they know them. Mm -hmm. It's not an obtuse they might not really know what weaving or crocheting or knitting or embroidery is and the, or felt. They don't know the, possibly the nuances that we do. But they know about fabric. Mm -hmm. And um, even today I read an article about Barack Obama and he talked about your, your personal fabric. Mm. And I thought, don't, he said, don't fray your personal fabric. Mm. And I thought, oh my God, I read that <laughs> And um, so I, I began to collect all of those things, and I knew that I wanted, I wanted to do an installation. Mm -hmm. um, I just, and I wanted people to be able to work on it, too. And so it was supposed to have opened last, uh, last week, mm -hmm. but it's not going to open until next year, because we obviously, well, the museum's closed, but people could not come and work on a jointly work together on a project. So I'm hoping next September people will be able to sit around this. But I didn't know what the substrate was going to be. <laughs> but I'm very interested in recycled objects. Having been a recycler, you know, I did piece after piece with uh, computer parts. I did piece after piece with battered instruments, uh, musical instruments. And I have a great collection of all kinds of things. And I, I, 
somebody said to me, my friend Kendra Crick said to me, do you want a parachute, a giant parachute? I said, yeah, I do. And it is a giant parachute. It's uh, 10 feet high, um, which means it has a diameter of 20 feet. Mm. And that was the perfect substrate. I think it's going to be the perfect substrate. I, you know, um, and then I started thinking about what I wanted, what I wanted to put on it. And the theme of, of Portland Textile Month this year has been reuse and... Um, and repair, too. And repair. Mm. And, and those go... I think re reuse and repair, they really <laughs> go together, you know. Um, somebody should make a little song about it. <laughs> Maybe we can get Randy Rainbow next, to make yeah, a little song. Yeah, next year we'll have to keep that in mind. Maybe yeah. we can have a, a little... <laughs> A little jingle. A, a little ditty. Um, and while I, I, I had some basic ideas. While I was sitting here and working, I would listen to OPB. And um, I would get new ideas and integrate them in into the piece of mending the social fabric. There's a um, Jewish principle called Tikkum Olam, which means repair the world. Mm. And... Um, it's a very moving thing for me. It's the, the thing that I relate to the most uh, about my background. Um, and as, as, as our current political situation got worse and worse, I began adding things to it. Mm -hmm. And one time I was sitting here and... Um, the president was going on and on and on about immigrants. And um, my father was an immigrant to this country. My mother was an immigrant to this country. Um, my relatives were immigrants to this country. A lot of my friends are immigrants to this country. Mm. And the, the nastiness was so horrible. I said, this piece has to have an immigrant Thing. And I came up with this phrase, which was, immigrants are a golden thread woven through the American tapestry. Mm -hmm. And then I said, okay, how am I going to do this? So I began making those flags, which is, this is going to be part, the flags are part of the bigger project, but I was able to, because they were, f six of them were finished, mm. I could show them at Portland Textile Month. Mm. And they're the kind of thing that, if I have a few left over, they could be another piece. Um, uh, and they're they, similar to the, and to the ones behind you? And they're you? just like the ones mm. behind me, except they have the gold, the gold, the gold uh, from a sari right. edge on it. So it's the golden thread. I, I think I remember some of that fabric. Right, there's, there's, there's yep, well, you probably can't there. see that. Um, yeah. Hang on. I can. Uh -huh. Yes, I remember that one. Yeah, so, so I had 30 feet of this taken from a sari, and I was able to put this around the edge so, um, so it, it is the golden thread. And so that will go around the top and will come down and take up two panels, take up two panels. This is a, a map mm -hmm. of, um, or I should say a pattern of two of the panels, and there are uh, 24 panels like this in the parachute. So I have quite a bit of room. So that will go around, and then two of the panels will have a big weaving with those in them. Mm. I wanted to uh, explore the, the topic of flags just because the last person uh, I interviewed, uh, Brittany Vega, uh, had a project dealing with flags, and mm -hmm. she was a, a bit of an expert. And so it was really interesting to hear her talk about how flags are created. Sometimes they stay the same, um, even when the times change, what they represent change, uh, changes. And so I wanted to, to just ask you the question, um, what do flags represent uh, to you in your work? Well, it's a really interesting thing because I was look, first looking at how do I make this and how, and I wanted to make, have as many different fabrics from around the world as I could get to represent past immigrants, you know, from generations back and current immigrants. 
and um, I didn't get all the fabrics I wanted, but I got quite, I mean, I got stuff from every continent except Antarctica. So I'm, I'm pretty happy um, about, about what I've been able to collect. And then I had to figure out, okay, I have all these fabrics. How am I going to do it? Hmm. And I was in New York and I went to this really adorable bead store and they also had a lot of prayer flags. Now, I don't want to call them prayer flags because it's not my culture. I don't understand them enough. I really don't want to piss people off, either advertently or inadvertently. Mm. Um, um, but I like the idea of, of the flags threaded together. Um, and I decided early on not to make them all the same because when I first started cutting them out, they were all three inches by five inches. And, but I wanted the um, unevenness of it all, the, the variety. It's just another way of showing variety. There's skinny ones and fat ones and long ones. And, um, and I, like it, uh, I like it visually better. Um, mm. Uh, I don't do very much geometric things, hmm. and they. Um, I explored two things. Uh, one was a you know a, a triangle, that was harder to um, to sew. I had these were all hand sewn, and if you make um, a little pocket, you fold you know you take a long piece of fabric, you fold it over. That's one seam you don't have to sew, and then you sew up. The two sides and the raw edge gets put into the into the into the ribbon. Uh, and I had these wonderful, wonderful um, sewing bees. I and I put up a thing on Facebook, and people called me up that I never even heard of or saw or met. We, you know, some people were Facebook friends, and. Uh, they came, 10 people at a time, and we did that mm. all through November, December, January, <laughs> February, till March 6th. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask you um, how you involved other people in the community. And so even before the pandemic, your project uh, involved a lot of people. Right. So uh, probably about 40 people um, came and sewed. Some people came... Other times there were about 20 more who were scheduled who didn't get to do it. Um, it was great fun sitting around this table. I had another table. Um, uh, and we just had the greatest time. And then people would come in the door and say, Oh, I haven't seen you for 15 years. <laughs> and, and I always had homemade ice cream and we always had tea, but they always had to be after they sewed so they wouldn't get the... But I have to tell you a story about some of the fabrics. You know, people hate Facebook. It's been really helpful in this project for me. So I put up, you know, a sewing bee. I would fill them in like an hour. Uh, then I would put up, I need. And I got this, I got several people I never even met sent me boxes of stuff. Mm. And one woman from... Uh, Orange County sent me this big box of stuff with that wonderful Indian puppet you saw before. And um, a lot of it I was able to cut apart and use. And she was coming through Portland last week. And so she got to see the window project and then she came to the studio. Mm. And that was, that was just a lovely circle how you do a project, people are really they're invested in it. I mean, they're, they're not as invested as I am, of course, because it's not theirs, but they're really invested in it. And I get these wonderful messages and or I get boxes of fabric or um, one day I got a, the doorbell rang, you know, not a doorbell, a knock on, on the door and there was a box. And then I got an email later and said, sorry, I had to, <laughs> you know, drop, <laughs> do a, you know, do a drop. And all these wonderful fabrics, so I didn't have to really go out and buy, even if it was, you know, a quarter of a yard here and a quarter of a yard there, and just not available, just wouldn't have been available. But so this connection, 
and I met this the, the woman on Facebook on something called vegetable varieties for gardeners. Mm. So it just evolved into an art thing as well as um, as well as a, a gardening thing. So we found these wonderful connections. Mm, that's lovely. Um, I was going to ask you uh, how. How do community projects uh, nourish you in a way, um, or do they nourish you in a way that's different than when you work on a um, project that you're well, only working on by yourself? Well, it's loads. <laughs> <laughs> I am a very social person. I mean, I, I mean, I love, you know, you're the highlight of my week. <laughs> um, oh, what person? I, I, I'm sure it'll get better over the weekend. <laughs> uh -huh. And um, it's, it, it's really nice to have um, human contact. And it also makes the project grow. Now um, I'm doing these, uh, I don't know, can you see the hankies from there? Okay. Um, I'm embroidering most of the hankies. My goal was we were going to sit around the table and do sewing bees. But a couple of people that I met through through last year's Texto Month have sewn, sewn them. And I'm not doing it as a wide-scale thing because I don't want to pack them up and send them away. It's too costly. There were several people who said, oh, I'll do a bunch. And then what if they don't come back? And... Um, so if people are kind of locally and they want to do one, um, or if they want to write um, a phrase or a little something uh, about something that uses a textual metaphor, I've done that also on Facebook where people have. So I can't get people to participate in the same way that I would have. But they're going to have a great, a great opportunity because the bottom of the, of the parachute, there are these uh, equilateral triangles um, that are just going to be full of embroidery hoops. Mm. And they're all going to have a little rip in them. And um, when, when the show opens, all the hoops will have little rips in them, and you can see the holes and see inside. Mm. And at the bottom, in the middle, is going to be that giant. I don't know if you saw that giant globe. I'm going to do something with that. Mm. Um, so they'll be able to look in kind of the repair the world part. But when the show is over, many of them will be patched. And while I'm at the, while I'm at the museum, and I should mention that it's the Jew, uh, Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education, well, I will be there as many times as I can, and there'll be kind of a patch or a stitch of the day. And people will come, and I think we have 10 little stools, and I'll give a kind of an impromptu workshop. They, they, we haven't quite figured it out. It can be people who just come in and say, wow, this is great, I'll stay, or um, that would be the easiest thing to do then to do reservations. And that should open up uh, October 2021. Yes. Is when and it will scheduled. be a four-month show, October, November, December, and January. Mm. So it's pretty exciting. And um, I'm, I'm excited about it. And I, I, I will love that interconnection. And I think people need it. The museum, when they accepted the program, thought it was a really healing. And we needed healing before the pandemic. And we really need that healing now. And this project has kind of saved my sanity. Mm. I don't know if I, if I was just starting it, whether I could have gotten the psychic energy to get up to my eyeballs into something, but it was already going. I, 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 been, I knew about it for a year before I, developing the concept a year before I even applied, uh, people would say to me, um, what are you going to do with this project? I said, well, I, I want to exhibit it. And they say, well, where? And I said, well, I want to exhibit it at the Jewish Museum. They just don't know about it yet. <laughs> and so I was very happy when I wrote the proposal and, you know, um, that they were very excited about it. So, um, and they've been very supportive. 
Can you tell me about the parachute material and how it, it relates to the overall theme? Well, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing. At, at first I was just thinking, oh, parachute. And I should probably mention I was married in a parachute. Hmm, I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> and it still fits. Um, you know, what a, a 1981 hippie wedding. Um, per, I, it was purple. But a different one. Yeah, whichever one, a small, a way smaller one, one like the one that's the practice one. Um, but when you think about what is a parachute, it fits so into this theme because a parachute is something that takes you to safety. It is, um, if you just jump out of a plane with no parachute, you die. You know, the, it slows down the speed. It, it makes you land safe so you don't kill yourself. But this particular parachute, it has the date on it, 1943. And it's, it's so big because it's a supply parachute. And what does a supply parachute do? It brings materials so you stay safe and you can survive. So I like that imagery. Um, and... Um, Someone, um, who shall remain nameless, was really upset that I mentioned in the grant that I was going to use a lot of Japanese um, mending techniques. And then I had this World War II parachute. And I thought, and she didn't say it to me, she said it to somebody else. So I got it wind secondhand and I thought, First of all, I love the idea of visible mending. And, um, and that's what's possible to do here so we can see how people mend. But Japan was our enemy and now is our friend. And is there anything more symbolic of mending than mending a friendship, either a person person to person or country to country. Mm. So it has, I think the more I look at this project, the more I think about it, the more I read, um, the, uh, I do read a lot, um, the more I find things that I hadn't really intended. I was just looking at it as a beautiful piece of fabric that could take on, because I think of myself as a sculptor, that could take on this sculptural shape. So the meaning, it, 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 it grows uh, it as grows. you, as you yes. work on it and learn right. more. About. And if, and if um, this woman hadn't mentioned, oh, you know, rolled her eyes and said, how can she, how could she have Japanese mending and have this World War II parachute in the same piece? I thought about it and I said, why does this irritate me so much? Mm. And it's because... We have mended that fence. Mm. Maybe not now, but we, 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 it will be mended again. Yeah, I, I think that's really interesting too, what you're saying about the seeing the vi visible mending, um, but the psychic fissures that happen um, you know, through war or other um, horrific events can be much deeper. And those sometimes we can't see and they, they remain per per pervasive. Right, so I'm, and, and one of the points that I want to make with this whole project is everybody has to participate. Just like, you know, we're right before the election now. Um, everybody should have done something. Call one person. Call one person. Um, uh, write one letter. Uh, do something to get people to vote. And... Uh, it's, it's, this piece is like that. You make change one stitch at a time. You mend one stitch at a time. Um, a friend of mine works for a big company and she, they have these meetings where they need to make change. And some of the people at the company say, that's too big a project. We'll never be able to do that. And so nothing happens. And she and I have these long discussions about if you take a small something 
and you, you can make that change in something small, then you have the impetus to go on to the next, the next thing and the next thing. And pretty soon, you know, that whole seam is sewed, that whole hole is, is fixed. And, and I just love the whole fiber metaphor because there's the how to make it, but there's also how to fix it. And um, that's, that's kind of exciting. Mm. So, Bonnie, I, I do have to ask you, uh, what is it about the color purple that, <laughs> <laughs> that connects with you so much? Because uh, when I see you, uh, I always I see a lot of purple. You see a lot of purple, but you also see a lot of or A lot of color, yeah, too, a lot in of color. I love color. Um, it makes me happy. Um, um, in, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to relate it to this, to this project, but... Um, I like that purple is um, the mixture of red and blue. And I, I actually like secondary colors better than I like primary colors. Um, for instance, I like this red better than I like that red. You know, I like the, the off colors. Um, but I used to go around the country teaching, um, going to conferences, teaching people how to draw on a Mac mostly to teachers, um, grade school teachers and high school teachers. And, you know, I always believed in just carry on. So I had to figure out how I could put everything in that little suitcase and still take, this will date myself, discs and all that other stuff. And I figured if you just had, if you just had a couple of colors and they all went together, but it's a beautiful color. I mean, it's it's dark and rich. It's my black, uh -huh. and I don't look good in black. So, um, or so you've been told. <laughs> I've been, well, one time this probably shouldn't be in here, but one time I was wearing this black jacket, and Richard said, "Oh, you know, you look about ten years older in that jacket." I took it off and put it in the recycle <laughs> bag. Richard, your husband. Richard's my husband. Um, uh, so I do love, I like ceramic, you know, I live in an orange and purple house. The colors inside are colors. My new color for walls is kind of this limey, brand new leaf green, mm -hmm. this yellowy. It just, it's like being in sun, even on these really horrible dark days. Um, you know, and the more, you know, it's like when people collect elephants. They have two elephants. They don't collect elephants, but everybody for their birthday gets them elephants and all of a sudden they're fun. <laughs> so I found, you know, I started out with color and um, I also moved across country and it was fun to have kind of an identity that people could hang their hat on, you know. It's kind of a conversation starter. It's a conversation starter. Um, especially in those days. I mean, I, I remember going to a meeting and everybody was wearing all black. And I was wearing, you know, some crazy thing. And, and you know, it was, it was kind of fun. People knew who I was. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I have two more questions for you. Um, is there a project that you haven't done or seen someone else do that excites you? Oh God, you know. This last year at this time, I went to um, New York and I picked the days to see this um, East Indian woman who made big macrame sculpture. And mm. her name is somewhere in my head, but I, at this moment I can't get it out. Um, and it was, it was very exciting. Um, I, I can't think of anything specific at at this moment because I am so focused on this and I know there will be other projects. I thought when you send me the questions, you say, are you working on anything else? And I'm thinking, oh yeah, right. I can barely get dinner. Um, um, I'm, I'm just so caught up in this, you know, and when I'm not, you know, sewing quotes, I'm looking for them or reading things or um, talking to people or it take, do you know how long? Well, you do know how long it takes to do Instagram and Facebook, and um, it's like a second job, right? And I'm thinking of it as as my diary. Mm. So that's really important to me. Um, 
and I have a whole lot more the, the wonderful stories of um, uh, one of the things I wanted to do is um, I liked what to see what other fiber artists are doing um, I did these two handkerchiefs. One was look for the common thread of decency, and the other one was look for, uh, see, see the diversity. Um, and one of the women I met on Facebook, another woman I met on Facebook, she, um, no, I met her on a London textile site. She was embroidering eyes, and I said, "Would you embroider me two eyes so I can put on those?" And so there's there's one of the eyes over there, and she did it on a separate piece of fabric so I can cut it out and embroider it. She was so tense about doing it on a hanky that was already made. So it's pretty, you know. I love picking, you know, trying to tie all these things together. Um, it's, it's interesting too, because I helped uh, a little bit with the Tiny Pricks installation. And so visually, I see some relations, uh, you know, obviously uh, a hankies, uh, embroidery, uh, em embroidering text on them, but um, they feel very kind of different. And so it's kind of interesting how, like you were saying, the medium can change, but it really is like- You know, the, when, when you talk about painting, it's just a white piece of canvas, you know? Uh, maybe it's a different size, but people forget that when they look at, at textiles. And, and I want to mention, I didn't know about the Tiny Pricks project, and it really aggravated me that I was on 8th Street in New York City when it was in a store. I must, I, I either passed it or I was uh, or I didn't go down the next mm. block. I didn't know about it. Yeah. And I'd already decided to do the hankies because I was, um, I met this friend I hadn't seen for 20 years and we were talking about my project and she said, you want 150 hankies? And I said, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I, I, I evolved how to use them. And then when I was looking at museums, hankies are a big thing now. There was work from South Africa. There was work from um, all over the all over the world where people have these beautiful textiles. They don't know what to do with them. Uh, the woman who gave these to me, they were her aunties, and her auntie worked in an office and got two weeks off, and she went traveling, and she couldn't afford when she was traveling. She couldn't afford to buy anything big, so she started collecting hankies, and I mean some of them are just I mean they're linen and silk and beautiful cottons and handmade lace um, and I was originally going to do them as a square but when I did the test a lot of testing involved in this um, I embroidered I, I was trying to look for stitches that wouldn't take forever and so when you went from one letter to the next if it was a square you could see right through it and see those back stitches, which I didn't, I didn't want to have happen. So by folding it, the stitches are in the back and there's enough of a um, backdrop. Plus it has a more body. And um, I also have some, let's see if you can see it. Oh, let's find one where it's, there's a grid under there that's used for needlepoint. And that way I don't have to write all the letters first because that takes longer to write them than to mm. sew them. So I just use um, a grid of three wide, three high, and push the letters. Um, it's a little bit of a mono font. <laughs> sometimes when I'm stitching, I say, oh, that eye has to be moved over. So sometimes I, un I unsew and move the letter over. That's um, true. It's interesting with the tiny pricks you have so many different people's hands, I guess. Uh, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm, that, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I never thought about text, uh, embroidered text as, as being a font, but uh, they, they have- It is, so I developed this font, and um, by the way, that one's Alicia's. Um, so every stroke of the pen is, a, is, a, is one stitch. Mm. And then I had to figure out what to do with O's. There was no good. So they're rectangles. 
the P's have a little, instead of having a little square I made, the P has a, has a little triangle. And the same with the R's. The R has a little triangle. Um, the S's are the hardest. It took me a while to mm -hmm. figure that one out. But it's very straight. Uh, it's all very straight. Yeah, it's kind of a, it's a very modern font. Uh, uh, kind of, uh, yeah, a lot of geometry in it. Um, and it's not, I have to say, I'm doing this big embroidery. And even though I did, I've done embroidery in my life, I never thought of myself as an embroiderer. I'm really a crocheter, you know, crocheting wire. Mm. <laughs> so, um, but I, I love this. It's very calming. I sit here, I, either, I listen to um, uh, books that I get from the Multnomah County Library. Um, I used to listen to the radio a lot. I can't do that, but I like the calming, mm. the calming thing. And I think, what a wonderful day I've had. And when, when you first came, I was sitting out on the, on the back porch of the studio and the sun is there the last part of the day. The sun is there and it's so beautiful. And um, I had to, though, put a piece of fabric on the, on the deck because I dropped a lot of needles down there. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, there's there's probably a party of needles and crochet hooks under my desk. Mm. All right, we've gotten to the last question, Bonnie, and it's a, a kind of big one, but um, how can we repair the future? <sighs> By being present. Um, and everybody has to do their part. And, and again, I, I mentioned this book, even if you can only do this much, I don't want to say I'm an old lady, but I, you know, I'm an old lady by the numbers. Um, I'm not going out and marching dur a, during a pandemic. I'm not um, going to, um, well, we can't help in the polls because we don't have um, voting polls because we have all vote by mail. Um, there are lots of things I'm not going to do, but there are things I can do. You know, I, I wrote I don't know how many postcards. Not as many as my friend. No, friend got a hundred postcards. We sent them off to Kentucky. I did maybe I don't know thirty of them. But you also had to pay for the postage, you know, and, and do all that. So I did that. I called all my relatives, um, and I have relatives from South Carolina <laughs> um, who are now considering voting in a different way. But you have to be present. You have to, and you have to do something. You can't just sit on your ass and think, oh, somebody else will do it. Somebody else. No, there is nobody else. Because if everybody says nobody else, it doesn't get done. But there is this, you know, we'll, we'll look at the sewing bee again. It's, it's, it's such a beautiful idiom for community. Um, the work gets done, you know. Um, and the work, and it's more than the work getting done. It's, it's, it's relationships get built. And um, the more relationships get built, um, um, you know, it's, it's, it's exciting. Um, so everybody has to be present and, and not feel, oh, I can't solve this problem. You know, there's a book by Annie Lamont, and she has to she has to do something with birds. She has to count birds. And somebody said to her, "Well, how do you do it?" And she said, "One by one, <laughs> you know, you, one thing, one thing, then becomes two things. Mm. So, um, be present. And it's a much more interesting life too. It's too boring not to be present." I think you're right. Um, thank you so much for your time, Bonnie. Oh. It's been great talking with you. Thank you. I just, I just love what you're doing with uh, both Textile Hive and Textile Month. <laughs>